Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 83, recorded December 19th, 2012. The Technologizer, Harry McCracken. Triangulation is brought to you by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, visit Stamps.com and use the offer code Triangulation. And by Ford, featuring Bliss, the blind spot information system with cross-traffic alert and active park assist. Check out these available features on the 2013 Ford Fusion and 2013 Ford Taurus and learn more at Ford.com slash technology. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show on the Twit Network where we get the most interesting people in technology, sit down, spend some time with them. I get to talk to them, you get to talk to them. Uh, that's where we get the two legs of the three-legged stool that is triangulation. Uh, the third leg is, of course, Mr. Harry McCracken this week. It's great to see you. You've seen, I'm sure, Harry many times on other Twitch shows. We'd love to have him on uh, This Week in Tech. Uh, and perhaps you know the name, many years uh, as a tech journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, you were editor-in-chief uh, of? I was at PC World PC for World. 13 years, I think. 13 years. It was a long time, like 1994. Onwards. And I really admired you because just a few years ago, while we're all doing what we're doing, kind of getting into new media, you abandoned PC World and said, I'm going to start a website, Technologizer. You were a big inspiration for doing that. Oh, thank you. Because I found it inspiring that you did that. Oh. I thought, that's a, that's a bold move. That's a gutsy move. And essentially go it alone, right? Technologizer is just you. It was me and some, some freelancers who helped out. Yeah. But a one-person show in ter terms of a company. And you actually also helped me start out because you had me on Twit, I think, right before the site even launched. That's right. And I remember um, at the time I had Twitter set up, so whenever I got a new follower, and I, I probably had a couple of hundred at the time, I would get an email, and I was on with you. And my inbox exploded, <laughs> and I, I turned that off immediately. We do now warn people, do not... <laughs> Do not have email notifications if you are on our shows. So you actually helped Good. me get, get going right, right before the site was even live. Good. Well, let's go back a little bit uh, earlier. How did you, when did you get into technology? Well, I don't ever remember not being interested in gadgets, but I got into PCs in 1978. Because, me too. Because, that was the earliest yeah. days you could. Yeah, that was pretty much when, when they became kind of semi-mainstream. The, the Apple II came out in 77, I think. Yeah, and the TRS-80, also 77. So what was your first computer? And, and the PET over there was also... Commodore PET. 1977. Yeah. My father brought home a TRS-80, and I think up, up until the time he brought it home, I didn't have a clue what a computer did really. How old were you? I was, I guess, 14. A perfect age. Yeah. Perfect yeah. age. So what was it that attracted you when you first started using it? I mean, what, was it games? For me, it was uh, games. Games and graphics. Basically, yeah. basically, I don't. I had so little inkling of what computers did, I was not aware that they could do animation. And, of course, the TRS-80 had terrible graphics right. and really bad animation, but it was still exciting. But it did something. Uh, and then I started typing in the programs and, and the instruction manual yeah. and uh, loading programs from cassette tape. Yeah, me too. And then I went to a high school which also had like three or four TRS-80s. Did you, did you get formal education at the high school, or was it just a no. hobby? It was a club, right? No, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a computer class, but I, I came in knowing more than right. the teacher. That's still true today, um, by the way. It's the worst place to get a computer education is high school. So, yeah, it was sort of a social thing. We, we had our computer lab, which right. for a time was in a, literally in a closet, <laughs> and then it moved into a classroom, and we would basically hang out and... <laughs> program and play games and kind of eat our meals down there. See, I'm about 10 years older than you, so the first computer I encountered was like Bill Gates, a timeshare terminal, also in a closet, because it was so noisy, you had to put it at the, uh, the, the, the middle school I went to in Rhode Island. This was probably 67 or 68. And uh, I had no interest in that. It was timeshare, it was teletype, it was loud, it was noisy, and mostly 
there were, the games were very primitive. There were games yeah. like Hunt the Wumpus, but they were very primitive. And it wasn't until the graphics computers came out, and it was around about 77, 78. I think it was an Atari 400 was my first one. I got one of those eventually. Yeah. That 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 because because the Atari twenty six hundred the game console was really popular and so I said well that's cool but I want I want more I want to do more so they got the four hundred and the eight hundred and like you it was the graphics it was moving a sprite around writing your first basic programs typing them in from compute and magazines yep. like that yeah and working in a story on Basic because I think a lot of people have memories about it uh... Basic is huge Basic is huge that and the first basics uh, were written uh, before Bill Gates. He gets the credit for it, of course, IBM Basic, PC Basic, but uh, there were basics prior to that. It started at, at Dartmouth, right? Basically, as a way to teach people about computers, people who were not math majors. Basic was was it beginners all purpose symbolic instruction code? I think is what it stands. For. Very good. I think that's. It. <laughs> I don't know. There was some little pocket of the brain that, <laughs> that, was, that was stored in. Uh, but it was designed to be a teaching language for it was a Fortran like. Right, it was it was language. sort of like Fortran. Yeah. But easier. Yeah, and thank goodness for basic. Although I think you and I and our generation learned how to program the worst possible way with go sub, go to. They say that once you learn basic horrible. you're you're ruined. You can't ruined. You, you can't learn anything else. Ruined for life. So you got into it, it was uh, fun for you. Did you did you think it would be a professional career? I sort of dabbled in writing things like like I there was a book of basic adventure games mm. which had mm-hmm. a game I wrote which I think I got like You're f- kidding. forty bucks or something for. Oh, that's neat! So one of your first things was a, an adventure game. Yeah, I wrote an adventure game. I wrote. Do you remember much of the uh, the storyline? It was set in the Arctic, and I had, I knew nothing about the Arctic. I actually also wrote a program which I uploaded to a BBS at the time, and then forgot about. And a couple of weeks ago, there's there's this guy who. Uh, named Ira Goldklang, who is an amazing repository of TRS-80 stuff. And I found he had this program I uploaded to a BBS, and I, I don't have a TRS-80 anymore, but I do have a TRS-80 emulator from my Mac. And I was reacquainted with my slot machine game, which, which I wrote knowing nothing about slot machines. <laughs> um, we, knowing how to write the code was more important than yeah. knowing what you were coding about. I basically did the animation of the reels cycling on my TRS-80. Oh, my so yeah, I, I wrote a few games, and I thought, Maybe I could make a lot of money at it, but uh, I did not. Well, you know, that was a good time to get into computing. Um, and how did you start writing about computers? Well, um, there was a magazine called Creative Computing, which I I loved. remember. Um, I loved that. Who, who was the, was it David Bunnell? Who was it? David All. David was, All, that's right. the Creative Computing guy. Dave Bunnell started PC Magazine right. and PC World and Mac World right. and Personal Computing and several others. And... Yeah, I was reading Byte and Creative Computing and a bunch of others. Creative Computing was fun because it was more uh, focused at a at a fun user yeah. instead of business. It was a great magazine. I essentially I, I sent them a review. I think of some games. I just you were sixteen. I, uh, I was I guess maybe eighteen, eighteen, seventeen. Yeah, and I basically just and I probably did on a typewriter at the time or maybe on sure. a Curious eighty, but I, re- I reviewed a few games and sent it in, and they sent me like sixty dollars or something like that. <laughs> And you get and the game reviews are short. They were just like little yeah. paragraphs. They would have tw- ten of them on a page. Right. I yeah. think they combined my like four reviews with six or seven others right. by other people. Right. And uh, I did a couple of things for them, and then I sort of segued into doing movie reviews for a while. What part of the country were you living in? Boston. Boston. My father taught at BU. Oh, neat. What did he teach? Uh, he, well, he actually started teaching at BU, and then he segued into being a administrator, and he worked in the president's office. Got it. For 30 years? Yeah, I was lucky because I was getting into this in Silicon Valley. I was working as a disc jockey in San Jose in the late 70s and early 80s. So there was this kind of, I don't know how it was in Boston. I guess because of MIT and all the colleges, there probably was some stuff going on. Well, Boston had the Boston Computer Society. The which, BCS, that's right. Which was sort of amazing because... There were two big user yeah. groups. There was, of course, there was Homebrew Computer Club, but then there was the Berkeley Macintosh Users Group. BCS, the Boston Computer Society. These were huge. It, it was thousands, hundreds, thousands of thousands. people at a meeting, and basically, anytime anything new came out, like the Macintosh, the East Coast premiere would be at the BCS, BCS meeting. So yeah. Steve Jobs would come right. and demo the Mac to the membership. Right. Unfortunately, I did not attend that month. Um, <laughs> you missed the big meeting. But I did go to a bunch of other ones of new Apple products. I think I saw like the Apple Three. And uh, People forget how important in the early days users groups were. It was, it was really when you got together. Most computer people were kind of loners anyway. But that one time a month, 
you would all gather together in a big auditorium. And uh, there was always kind of a standard program. I don't know how BCS was. Did, did it start with questions? I think there was some Q&A, and you'd kind of mill about and talk to other folks. Right. There was a, a disc um, librarian who would have a bunch of discs yeah, in the I, back. I, got, I eventually got my Amiga discs. Right. I think at the Amiga subsection of the BCS. Right. Amiga SIG. Then, and, and then uh, at, the, at least at BMUG, there was a Q&A thing where you would stand up and say, I'm trying to find a way to hook up a, a daisy wheel printer to a TRS-80, but I don't know what kind of serial interface. Right. And then there's always these hardcore geeks in there say, well, what you need? And there was this great give and take. And then they'd have a raffle, right? They'd get uh, software from the different uh, companies. Yeah, I think there were some giveaways. Yeah, there was giveaways. Uh, you'd have, uh, you'd have uh, from, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I just remember these big boxes of software. In those days, they were giant boxes of software. And they'd give that away. And then you'd have a speaker from the industry who'd come up and talk about it. It might be Steve Jobs. Yeah. Who else did you see? Do you I remember any I remember seeing the VIC-20. The which VIC-20 was from a, Commodore. Sort of the predecessor of the yeah. Commodore 64. Yeah. Several different iterations of the TRS-80. Uh, Atari stuff. That, you're, you're younger than Paul Thorat. Did you see Paul Thorat wandering around in any of these BCS meetings? I don't know if he was a BCS I wonder member. if he was there. I wonder. That's uh, an interesting All sorts question. of interesting people were there. The, actually, the first one I went to was the demo of VisiCalc. And I think maybe it was the first public demonstration of the first spreadsheet. Wow. And, and VisiCalc was uh, uh, Dan... Dan Bricklin, Bricklin and Bob Frankston. And Bob Frankston, who are still actually they're around still and around part of the community. And, yeah, they're still doing cool stuff. Yeah, Bricklin and Frankston. So they came and they demoed it? They demoed it. And wow. uh, even though I was like a, a guy, like I was entering high school and not particularly interested in math, I, I think I did sort of... I was smart enough to understand it was a big deal. Huge. You would like they would type in numbers, yeah. and then there would automatically be a total at the bottom. Auto ca- auto recalculate. You yeah. change one number, the number at the bottom changes. That was huge. And they uh, and and it was the first killer app, I think. I mean, yes. It, it w- um, by which I mean, and this I don't know if this phrase still exists, but it was an application so important that you would buy a computer just to run the application. There is one earlier uh, candidate for the be- first killer app, and that would be the electric pencil which was sort of the first microcomputer word processor. Right. But VisiCalc, I mean, act, actual real companies went out and bought Apple computers. Apple just to run VisiCalc. And it was, yeah. a, it was a big deal for the Apple II because at first it ran only on the Apple II. Right. Yeah, that was, that was the killer app. There's no killer apps anymore, are there? And, you know, the web is the killer app these right. days. So your, you bro- your browser is the closest thing you have to a killer app. Right. Uh, there, I think there are killer apps for, for tablets and phones to some extent. There though. might be. You might buy an iPhone in the early days because only Instagram was only on iPhones. You might mm-hmm. say, well, I'm going to buy an iPhone because I want to use Instagram, uh, for instance. But now everything's on everything pretty much. So, all right. So did you – now you went to college. Did you study uh, computer science or writing? Well, I took one class on Pascal and failed it. <laughs> and, uh, it's different at that level, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> because I was so good at basic, I couldn't even understand Pascal. Right. So I, I majored in history. Smart man. That's I what minored, I majored in. <laughs> and I minored in English. I figured history is a good background for almost anything. Sure. Which turned out to be true. Yeah. Where would you go to school? Boston University. Be you. All right. But – so when did it start becoming a career for you instead of, uh, instead of just a hobby? Well, I was sort of dabbling in freelance writing. I, I would do movie reviews. I, I wrote for a magazine called Cine Fantastique, which was a slick magazine about adventure movies and oh, cool. science fiction and horror. And so I would do so movie So were you kind reviews. of a geek? Were you, it was the geeky movies yeah. that you would cover? Uh, yeah. To some extent. Actually, after a while, I would, I would review whatever they asked me to. And they would ask me to review horror movies, which I actually had no interest in, but it was still fun to review them. Um, so I was doing that. I was, um, I was and am still interested in cartoons and animation. And a friend of mine started an animation fanzine, and I started helping him with that. And I took over more of that and right. got into desktop publishing. Ah, so you the, got an yeah. Apple Macintosh in the early days and a laser, laser writer. For, laser writer and page maker. I oh, did, man. I used page maker when it had a limit of 16 pages per publication. <laughs> and if you wanted to do something bigger than 16 pages, you had to do it in separate files. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I was doing oh, yeah. that, and this, I was all, this was when I was going to college. And so um, basically almost all of my spare time was devoted to, to writing and, and publishing stuff. Right. And right. if I had been a little bit younger, I would have been doing this all on the web, but instead we did it on paper. And that's a huge, that was a huge uh, shift. It really was. But in the 80s, it, there was no web. 
uh, you had modems, you had BBSs. That was the closest thing. We I was had. on CompuServe and, and Bix and yeah. uh, you, Okay, this is a question. This is how you could tell if somebody's an old timer. Do you remember your CompuServe number? I want to say it was seven four three five two comma three one one four. That's that's very good. Clo- that's close. I was seven five one zero six comma three one three four. It's fine. And you're right. You start to forget it, but you what you remember the format. It begins with a seven. It's got a comma. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's impressive. <laughs> Wait, did you use MCI mail? That was the earliest email uh, I encountered. There was. I was never on MCI mail, but the first computer magazine I worked for, I, I believe, at the start, we had like one email address for the entire publication, which was an MCI number. Yeah. And like once an hour, we had a Mac, which once an hour would dial out on the dial up <laughs> and, and ping MCI mail and bring in our, our email. Look at all these. Curtis B is 71310, 1271. <laughs> Web 5197, 74001, 3646. And you could tell how long they were on CompuServe because the yeah. lower the 7,000 number. Was there somebody who was like 0001? Yeah. Comma, 0001? yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think they were, all began with seven. CompuServe, I'm trying to remember, was CompuServe, it was, I think, H&R Block that had yes. leftover computer time. Because during the day, they were calculating tax returns like crazy, and nobody was using them at night. They said, boy, there might be a business in kind of renting out computer time at night. And it actually, I think it was, from, it was my first experience online. And, and it I, was relatively cheap, although by today's standards, it was really expensive. It was like... Because they charge you by the hour. Wasn't like fifteen bucks an hour or yeah, something like that. Yeah, they charge you by the hour. And I remember uh, I had a three hundred baud couple phone modem that was a coupler. Mm-hmm. So you would. <laughs> I've met people today. They go, "What the hell?" You, dial. you would dial the number on the phone, and you probably had a dial. Right. You're and then for the squeal. you go, eh, and then you'd quickly jam it on the coupler, which was an acoustic seal. It had rubber cups. And it would then do the training, and you don't, you'd lucky if you could get it to work. 300 baud. 300 baud, so you could, you could read more quickly than the text came in. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so you'd be, there you go, there's an acoustic coupler. That was a fancier one than I had. That's a pretty fancy one. And then, um, and then of course, the text would come across the screen. It was text, not graphics. And it would say, I can't remember, login, probably, colon. And you'd type 75106,3135. And then password. <laughs> type that. And then you'd wait away to think. And either you could see it thinking. And then it would scroll up, welcome to CompuServe. And there was a kind of a text-based menu that you'd select an item from. There was and news and... Uh... I played, played Colossal Cave, speaking of adventure yeah. games. So it had one of the early adventure games, which originally was Crowther and Wood's Dungeon, mm-hmm. whatever it was called. And, uh, and they had it on CompuServe. It was an extended one, a 451.1. And uh, I literally... Uh, fortunately, I borrowed a friend's account. He was at Atari, so he had a comp account for CompuServe. Thank you, Owen, because I spent about 800 hours playing Colossal Cave on my 300 baud modem. And if I'd had to pay for that, I'd, I'd probably be in prison today. There was the CB simulator. Was when, wasn't that like a <laughs> chat room or something? Yes, that was the early and, chat room. And right? it was like, you know, calling it the CB simulator made sense at the time. Yeah, because, oh, I get it. They'll talk and then I'll talk. It's, it's like a CV. <laughs> and I think we might have even used CB jargon in there a little bit. Um, well, that's where you got the idea of like handles. And- handles. That's right. Do you think that that chat handles come from CB? Yeah. I oh, absolutely. The, 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 yeah. I never thought about that. Wow. All right. So we're going to take a break. We're talking to Harry McCracken. We're now going to get into the era of uh, your first magazine, your first computer magazine. What was the name of it? I worked at a magazine called Computer Buying World, which was wow. a big flop, but fun. Computer Buying World. Was it the predecessor to, what was that big Ziff Davis we were, magazine, we Computer were, Shopper? We thought we were going to kill Computer Shopper, which, <laughs> which we failed to do. Nothing killed Computer Shopper except life. Yeah. Then that killed it pretty good. We'll talk about that in a second. But first, let's talk about mailing things. You wouldn't think that that would be an interesting topic, but it is if you're in a business where you have to do it. And I'm not talking about 100 Christmas cards, kids. I'm talking about invoices, mailers. I'm talking about packages. I'm talking about somebody who sells stuff on PayPal or eBay. Maybe you're on Etsy. And you've already dealt with this thing. You've got to buy bubble pack. You've got you to package them up. You've got to guess. You lick some stamps, put it on the front, t- type out an env- a mailing label. You've got to bring it to the post office. And then you know what happens? You get there, and there's 1,000 people in front of you mailing their Christmas cards. And they've never been to the... It's like they never have been to the post office. They don't know how it works. You get in line over there. 
What? Where do I go? You get in line over... I've got to... No, this is not for you. December is the wrong month to be doing mailing at the post office. This is the month you need to try stamps.com. This is the pro mailing solution for people who mail stuff for a living. I want you to go to stamps.com and take a look at it. They let you print U.S. postage. You buy it and print it on your computer, on your printer. We've got a great USB scale for you, which is fantastic that... Uh, actually does the weighing and tells the comp- you don't have to enter anything in. In fact, you don't even have to enter. If you're Amazon, eBay, Etsy, PayPal seller, if you're using QuickBooks, if you've got an address book on your computer, you don't have to enter anything in. Uh, Stamps.com smart. It'll actually pull that information out of your computer, print out the label, prints right on an, an envelope, including your logo, the return address and everything, and all the postage. Or you can print labels for packages, even international mail. Stamps.com is fantastic. Here is the, uh, the, the the USB scale, by the way. This is, by the way, this is the kit you'll get. I just want to let you know what it's going to look like. So you go to stamps.com. You sign up for the trial offer. One of the things they send you is this great USB scale. And by the way, you can cancel. The scale is yours to keep. It's kind of our gift to you uh, from stamps.com. So the scale is up to 25 pounds. It's USB. You just plug it right into the back of your computer, Mac or PC. And now you're mailing like a pro. Um... So here's the deal. Go to stamps.com. You probably, you know, low $80. That's good. $25 free posters. That's good. I'll take that. No. No. Hey, click the microphone above that, which says, heard us on a podcast. Enter in before you buy. All one word. Not triangulation. Oh, yeah. Do triangulation. That's the name of this show. <laughs> triangulation. Thank you. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. You enter in the name of your favorite show, in this case, Triangulation. And look at that, that $80 offer. Suddenly, you get an old man on there saying, hey, I got a $110 offer for you. $55 in free postage, a free digital scale, $5 supply kit, and a four-week trial just for using our offer code, Triangulation. How about that, huh? How about that? Triangulation, that's the show, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> we thank stamps.com for their support. Really is great if you do any mailing. This is the way to do it. We do it. We got two scales. Stamps.com. Harry McCracken is our guest. He's the technologizer. Now at Time Magazine, which is kind of cool. I, I want to talk about that saga. So what was it? Computer shopping? A computer buying world. Computer um, buying world. The notion was the computer shopper was kind of for consumers. Computer buying world oh. would be aimed at businesses. Business. Sure, that makes instead sense. Of, instead of buying one PC, they'd buy 100 which would be very appealing to advertisers. And now who was doing that? What was the company? It, it was part of IDG, IDG. Which, which also okay. publishes, published and still publishes PC World and right. Mac World. Right. And um, Computer Shopper at the time was literally 1,000 pages, mostly advertising because if there were hundreds of PC companies. It was amazing. Uh, and there was, you could make yeah. furniture out of a year's subscription. Yeah, it was amazing. And this was before the web, so if you wanted to advertise That's where you went. computers, you did it in Computer Shopper. That, yeah. So that, what, what, there were two big companies. I mean, there were some small ones, but it was IDG was one, Ziff Davis was the other, and these were the giants in technology publishing. And so, of course, if 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 uh, Ziff Davis had PC Magazine, you had to have PC World. Right. If Ziff Davis wow. had Computer Shopper, you had to have Computer Buying World. They had Mac User. We had Mac, Mac user, World. Mac World. You had uh, to. It was head to head. And I remember going to the Com, uh, Comdex, and it was. <laughs> You go, hello, McCracken. Because <laughs> I was on the Ziff Davis team. You know, we practically had jerseys and helmets. It really was, wasn't it? We, we called Ziff Davis the evil empire. Yeah, well, I don't remember what we called you. But I didn't. <laughs> but it wasn't nice, it's, I'm I sure. think uh, it seemed like Ziff Davis people maintained that IDG was not worth paying attention to. We don't to. even. Because I, I, Maybe it was just my perception as a Ziff Davis guy, and this was in the early 90s where it was starting to go down. It was all starting to fall apart. Uh, but I, I, my impression, I actually liked the IDG guys a lot. I was a little worried about Ziff Davis. Um, and, in fact, I was right to be worried. IDG has survived. Ziff Davis is kind of IDG still off. exists and is, is doing okay. Yeah. And Ziff Davis also still exists but is much, much, much smaller. So after Computer Buying World, CBW Yeah, yeah so died. CBW... Uh, Lasted for I guess um, a couple of years. And what maybe. were you writing for that? I was I was like the reviews editor, so uh, I was in charge of the reviews section. You stole those out to the um, freelancers. And- we were reviewing things like two eighty six laptops and new versions of WordPerfect and that did, kind of stuff. Did you have a lab, a place that you could review these kind of? Or we had a lab, but it was like a room which I would go into. 
<laughs> Ziff uh, Davis, and this was nuts, built a facility, a testing facility, its own building uh, in Silicon Valley, in Foster City. Uh, I think Bill McCrone was the guy who uh, designed that and oversaw that. Uh, and that was a boondoggle. We were like a small operation. There <laughs> that was were, a real boondoggle. There were maybe like like five editors, and I, I did right. I did the reviews and the tech stuff. Was it as thick as Computer Shopper? No, it was yeah. at the end uh, like ten percent as big as uh, Computer Shopper. That's probably. when I knew computer publishing was dead. Was when I saw Computer Shopper in its final stage, because that was literally it was a it was a tabloid sized magazine that was usually about three or four inches thick, and it went down to nothing, a quarter of an inch. Yeah. And that's when I knew it was all over for uh, computer magazines. The internet had destroyed that business. So after uh, CBW, where'd you go? So uh, for a while, I freelanced. Um, and uh, we shared office space for a while with the PC World folks. And PC World published something which also sounds like something of the past. So they had a special edition called PC World Lotus Edition. <laughs> all uh, about Lotus Notes. Which was all about 123, one, uh, Ami Pro. <laughs> Ami Pro, the word uh, processor. You know, I loved Ami Pro. Yeah, it was great. That was the best word processor I ever used. This was at a time when, when Lotus, which just, just recently IBM killed the Lotus name. But yeah. back in the, in the 90s, Lotus was big. And, uh, and we published a special edition of PC World with Lotus. And I knew the guy who was in charge of it. And... Um, he said he he called me in and he said, you know, I I think probably PC World Lotus Edition is not going to be around for that much longer. It was based on on a contract with Lotus. You mean it was it was it was a ma- it wasn't just a one month special. It, it was, no, it was, it every was a issue. magazine. It was your copy of PC World with with really well done extra pages all oh, about Lotus. Interesting. And he said we have this this contract renewal coming up, and I, I think they probably won't renew. Yeah. But we do have this job, uh, and I thought of you, and. I took the job mainly because it sounded like the Lotus edition wouldn't continue forever. I, I right. figured I didn't want to do Lotus forever, but it, it might be a foot in the door at PC World. Um, and so I stopped freelancing and took that job. There's a certain uh, symmetry to this because Lotus 123 took over from VisiCalc, mm-hmm. which we were talking about. That was Mitch Kapor's IBM PC version of the dominant app of the 70s and 80s. Uh, VisiCalc was the, the spreadsheet, which is, was later eclipsed by Excel from Microsoft, of course. So, yeah, and, and because Excel was overtaking 1, 2, 3, the idea of a PC World Lotus Edition was somewhat shaky. Yeah. Um, but what did, did they give you at uh, PC World? What did you, what'd you do there? So, uh, my, my boss was right. PC World Lotus Edition only lasted for a few months. You jumped off that lily pad. Um, but this was at a time when computer magazines were still doing really, really well. Yeah. This was the era of Windows 95. Oh, yeah. And when people were first getting on the Internet. Oh, yeah. And so... Um, Expects P- accounts, baby. So PC World was doing really well, and there was this big rivalry with PC Magazine. And, uh, and PC Magazine was known for having a great reviews section mm-hmm. uh, with all the serious lab stuff. And yeah. PC World wanted to have a good... We do the printer roundups. You'd right. review 800 printers. Totaling. I mean, it was an amazing thing. Jim Lauterbach worked there. Of course, he later worked at Tech TV, and uh, he was part of the labs. Uh, Bill McCrone was part of the labs. That was a big thing. So IDG so, said, we've so got to do that. We need more reviews editors, and I became a reviews editor at PC World. I was still in Boston, by the way, at this point. Um, and Is that where had, IDG was based? IDG is headquartered in Boston, but PC yeah. World was in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. But we also had a Boston office, which right. I worked out of. Right. Ziff Davis was in New York City. They, they had a place on Park Avenue. It was one Park Avenue, but it, we all called it one Dark Avenue because it was the oldest, coldest, horrible building <laughs> uh, near the Pan Am building, which arched over uh, Park Avenue. And maybe even part of that, I can't remember. So, uh, so I'm, uh, you're in Boston. Uh, did you eventually move out to San Francisco? For I PC did. World? I kept. Uh, I liked Boston, and they kept suggesting I move to San Francisco, and I, I would come out a lot. And finally, uh, in 2002, I had a boss who begged and pleaded. And uh, 2002. And, oh my uh, God! Years, years later, the internet's and, uh, already been born. Well, I, yeah, I figured if if this publishing thing doesn't work out, Boston will probably still be there. Right. And so I did move out, and now I, I don't want to leave. I yeah, it's out great here. here. Yeah, yeah. We're talking to Harry McCracken, a uh, former editor of PC World who's now on his own, except he's not because Time Magazine now is getting into technology. I want to ask you what you, your dominant memory of the 90s was and what you feel like the big trends uh, of the 90s were. I'd like to talk a little more. I like the reminiscing stuff. Getting old, we got a nice fire going in the fireplace here. 
Uh, oh, that sparked up a little bit there. Might need to poke that a little bit later on. Um, but first, you see Harry. He's looking at that. Look at the look at the monitor. Ooh. Yeah, it's burning. Even better. <laughs> How did they do that? <laughs> I don't ever want to give this up. I love this. We used to mock. There was a sales guy. I won't. Oh, oh, oh don't stick oh, your hand sorry. in the fire. You could get burned. There was a sales guy. He was. See, there you go. That's the. That's the experimenter. That's the scientist. Well, what happens if I? I gave it away. Yeah. No, that's good. Uh, there was a guy. There was a sales guy. We used to mock at Ziff Davis, who had a faux fireplace in his office. It was one of those things you just bump up against the wall, and it looks like it's burning. It looks just like this. And he was so proud of it. He invited people and said, well, I'd sit by the fire. <laughs> now, now, so what we were doing, was this like pre-ZDTV? Or yeah. Was... I'll tell you my story. Yeah. Because that's a checkered story. But first, a word from Ford. I mean, Ford. Ford Motor Company. My favorite. You know, uh, the Mustang is, uh, is, is going to be handed down and the Ford Fusion is coming along. And it's because I want the latest, greatest toys. Now, I was really thrilled in 2010 when I got the Mustang, the Ford Sync, and I could talk to the car. Remember, I used to go on and on about Sync and how to play my music and I could talk to it. Well, they have moved on. This thing is now a consumer electronic playground in the new Fords. Things like this, the Bliss Blind Spot Information System. You've got... One of the things they're doing with the cars, they really see these as a platform. They know that technology is going to change. And so what they do is they load these things up with sensors. They basically see it as a platform. They use the sensors as, as needed, but they also give an API, and so they're getting developers to write apps for the cars. So, this, so two of the sensors are radar. They've got radar all over the thing, radar. It's amazing. As this stuff gets cheaper and cheaper, they can incorporate it into your fender. You've got radar in your fender on the rear uh, side of the car, the left and the right, that's watching the blind spot, you know, the part you can't see with the side mirrors. And when there's a car in that blind spot, you get a little light on the mirror that shows you there's a car there and a little audible tone. They also use it as you're parking out, so it helps you with uh, pulling out of parking spaces. If you can't see around the cars, which happens all the time to me, uh, it will warn you there's oncoming traffic. You can actually see a signal that there's oncoming traffic. You've got radar in the rear of your car. That's like the camera in the front that keeps you in the lane. Uh, it's, it's like the intelligence that gives you auto park assist. This is wild. I'm, they must be using radar also in the front and the back here because you're driving, you press a button, you're driving along, it says, okay, I see a parking space. It literally on the screen it says, pull forward. You pull forward, you stop. It says, okay, I got it from here. Zzz, the wheel goes, the steering wheel, zzz, in 24 seconds. This is the, uh, is this the bliss? This is the bliss here. So this is the blind, on the video, if you're watching the video, they've got the blind spot information system. The, the park assist, in 24 seconds, the steering wheel goes, zzz, and it parks you in less than 24 seconds parallel, perfectly. Much better than I could do. You know, you know how you learn the, all the rules, you see the, watch this. The car, this is a, I think it's an edge or an escape. Uh, it's available in the 2013 Ford Taurus or the 2013 Fusion. That's my next car. The car literally does this. And the first time I, I got in a car with Park Assist, I was a little freaked out because it's like driving itself. But it does it perfectly. It's a little, it's a little uh, autonomous vehicle for at least that few seconds. I'll tell you what. I cannot wait to get the state-of-the-art Ford vehicle. I want you to take a look. You can go to Ford.com slash technology or go to a Ford dealer uh, near you. And test drive the 2013 Fusion or the 2013 uh, Taurus, uh, and give it give it give a try to the a Park Assist. It's so cool. We are talking to Harry McCracken, good friend, for uh, many years. Uh, he's been on Twit many times. Uh, is a, one of the most astute uh, people covering technology. Things have changed so much. The internet. You've mentioned a couple of times. That really was the watershed, wasn't it? In the mid 90s. Yeah, I mean, um, I always think back to the fact that the two best selling issues of PC World of all time were both. 1995. One of them was a cover story called How to Connect to the Internet, which at the time you still needed someone to explain to you how to do. Because you'd have uh, a slip account, and you'd, or you'd, right. have, you'd have to turn it into a PPP account, and there were these little programs you'd run. And it was kind of complicated. It was crazy. And the other one was Windows 95, which yeah. was also a huge deal. So, not, you know, in some ways, 95 was the beginning of a of a big change in technology. There was certainly kind of the era where Microsoft became totally dominant as well. Well, I remember Steve Jobs saying that. He said, uh, we, we had a 10-year lead on Microsoft. In 1984, when we came out with the Mac, we had a 10-year lead, and we frittered it away, 
And when he says we, he means people like Gil Emilio and Michael Spinner, the guy, John Scully, the guys who fired him. They frittered it away. And he says by 1995, Microsoft had not only caught up with leapfrogging us. And that's true. Windows 95 was, pr- we forget now, but it was good. And it was way better than Windows 3.1. <sighs> it was horrible. Uh, but it still, it wasn't quite NT. It still, you could crash the whole operating system with a, with a program crash. And with those new browsers, that happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, you still needed to manage your memory a little bit oh, by hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a whole market in memory uh, managers. QEMM. QEMM. Yeah. Wow, I forgot all about that. Those were bad old days. <laughs> yeah, so those are the two things that pop into mind, kind of yeah. the web and Microsoft's yeah. dominance. Did you know in 95, I mean, that the Internet would disintermediate and would be bad for magazines? No, because it, it took surprisingly long. Um, there was this sense of ruling the world. I remember with Zif Day, with PC Magazine particularly, which I did not work for, um, but they were the masters of the universe at yeah. that time. You know, they'd go to Comdex, which also went away, and uh, and they were they, they were gods. They had unlimited expense accounts. They could see anybody, talk to anybody. They dance with Bill Gates. I mean, PC World was very successful, and it came out once a month. PC Magazine was even more successful and came out twice a month. Twice a month. And continued to be do very well for, for really a long time yeah. after the web was around. So it was in uh, 19, uh, probably 91 or 92 that they thought we should be in a TV. They really didn't get this internet thing very well. <laughs> they thought the TV was going to be the next big thing. And uh, they decided to do a TV arm and they put Bill McCrone, who was the editor-in-chief of PC Magazine, had started the PC uh, Mag Labs, which eventually became Ziff Davis Labs. So he was, a, you know, he was like their heavy hitter in charge of a television division. They went out and they got a guy named Gary Kay, who's a very good television producer, ended up working for CNN and a lot of uh, other companies. A- as a consultant, he was the TV guy. And, the, and was McCrone and, Mc- and Gary Kay were looking for people to help him build a TV presence. And uh, I don't know how I got an appointment with them, but I went and I met with them in 1992. And they said... Good. We got a job for you. Gina Smith and Jim Latterback, two Ziff Davis heavy hitters, were doing a TV show. They launched in 90, I want to say 94, out of the old Apple TV in Cupertino called The Personal Computing Show. There's a good name. And they were in front of a green screen. It, they had taken uh, pictures of a very nice office, and they just shot an hour and a half of the office with birds. And, and then that was, the, that was supposed to be where they were. And uh, I came in as a consultant and eventually ended up hosting the show with Gina. We did one season, that's all. And they, the plan, which is a very weird plan, and this came from their computer shopper days, was they were going to do editorial and they were going to do shopping. And that would pay for the editorial. So we would do a half hour of editorial and then a half hour of completely, you know, advertising, shopping, like home shopping network for computers. And that was going to be a computer shopper show. And that, so they were buying time on CNBC and all these stations to put the editorial half hour and then the shopping half hour. But the shopping flopped, so the editorial had to go away. They couldn't afford to, to do that. And that was how Ziff Davis Television started. I stayed with them, Gina, and I stayed with them developing shows through uh, 96 when we paired up with uh, MSNBC and did the site. So Ziff Davis thought TV was going to be the next big thing, even as the Internet started to take over. And so did CNET. I mean, CNET was originally a, a t- more of a TV company than I... Yeah, I worked for Halsey company. in the earliest days in 91. That was before Ziff Davis. We did a pilot, Fred Davis and I, and John C. Dvorak and Gina. We did a, a roundtable show that was horrible. <laughs> and I think at that point, uh, CNET said, you know, we're, I think we'll do, a, we'll do the web first. They were smart. See, that was, that was the difference. CNET said... We think it's going to happen on the web. We'll do TV to support the web, but the web is where it's going to happen. And that was a very, as it turned out, a very good move for them. Do you remember Ziff Davis Interchange by any chance? What was that? That sounds it, familiar. It was an onla- a beautifully done online service which Ziff Davis put together. A silo, like um, AOL? And- it was sort of like a really well done AOL, but they were going to launch it around like early 95. So Oops. the timing didn't work out. <laughs> Did IDG have things like that that they were looking at? You know, the thing about IDG was it was always very decentralized, and right. the the decisions didn't come from the, the top. Right. And essentially, 
PC world would be competing with InfoWorld and MacWorld and the other guys. And Within, I, the, it's kind of like Microsoft today where the divisions yeah. compete with each I did, other. IDG would publish other magazines which sort of competed with PC world right. and everybody sort of had their own online strategies and so there was no no right. one place and the folks at the top didn't tell anybody what to do. Ziff was family run so it was a little bit different. It was really a dictatorship. Bill Ziff and his sons ran that place. And Bill Ziff was an interesting fellow because he had run like sailing magazines. They were specialty magazines, not computer magazines. Sold those all, got into the computer magazine business, and then very wisely got out of it in the nick of time and sold it to Forceman Little, which was a holding company. And it's been downhill every day. I th actually, maybe it was SoftBank before Forceman. IDJ was founded by Pat McGovern. Pat McGovern in, in 1964. One, yeah, he was and a he, genius. He's still there, but he, yeah. he very early on decided he didn't want to tell people what to do. Uh, he was <laughs> he sort of almost acted more like a venture capitalist right. who, who would give money. To he was startups. kind of he's kind of legendary. He's still around. Yeah. Still, What's he doing these days? He's still the chairman of he, IDG. IDG, and they do conferences mostly now. Uh, but well, they still have MacWorld well, magazine. There's still MacWorld and PC World and Computer World. PC World is still in print. PC World still exists in, in print. paper. So does MacWorld. I know MacWorld uh, does. Yeah. And IDG also it has magazines all over the world, which was kind of a difference right. between it and Ziff Davis. Right. Ziff Davis would tend to license right. these. There's PC Mag uh, Brazil, but it's not as if Davis public. IDG owned a lot of them, and yeah. IDG got into China very early, uh, yeah. and IDG started doing venture capital in places like China. So as it turned out, Pat McGovern knew what he was doing. He kind He's, of he has had the last laugh. Uh, you know who did also knew who he was doing is the guy who owned Comdex, Shelley Adelson. Mm -hmm. There was a smart fellow. He, uh, he basically put together Comdex, a computer dealers expo. The idea was bring computer hardware manufacturers together with dealers at a yearly meeting in Vegas. It was huge, bigger than CES. At its peak was probably half a million, three and three quarters of a million people. It was huge. I, I can't remember what the largest was. It was ginormous, it was and, and that, was, that was before there was a huge convention center, so it took over the entire the town. The sands, it would take over the convention, it would take over every bit of... Las Vegas. You couldn't get a room in Las Vegas because it was Comdex week. Uh, and Shelley also very wisely got out of Comdex before it crashed. It eventually went away. He took. He made a lot of money on that. Uh, then invested in casinos, not just in Vegas, but also in Macau. Made billions of dollars. He's one of the richest men in the world. <laughs> and it all started with the computer dealer expo, Comdex. So PC World, why did you leave PC World? Because that's got to be a pretty gutsy thing to do. You're, you're doing well there. Well, essentially, um, I had been there for 13 years. And, um, you know, the PC was great, but it, it was kind of clear that the PC was not going to dominate everything. Really? And as, as much as um, I would always explain to people that the PC was really important and PC World was also about HGTV and phones right. and cameras... When you, when you have a PC in your name, it does tend to define you. And it also occurred to me, based partially on looking at what people like you were doing, that a journalist didn't necessarily need a large company anymore. Right. And uh, thanks to the web, you know, a one-man show could have access to the same tools and publishing platforms that large companies had uh, without all the bureaucracy and uh, so forth. And... PC World had existed before I got there and did fine. I knew it would, it would do well without me. And I thought the most exciting single thing I could do would be to try to create something from scratch. You know, it was right about then that PC Magazine gave up printing editions. Yeah, that like, happened like a few months like after. All afterwards. online. Did that feel like a victory? Like we, we're the last man standing? Oh, I've sort of been through that twice just, just because Newsweek, which competed with Time, for They've gone away too. Years, They've announced that something. after January, they're yeah. no longer publishing a print version. Yeah. yeah. I think in both cases, um, the competition had moved past the competition between those right. two arch rivals, anyhow. And you kind of don't want to see these guys uh, struggle and fail because no. they're in the same business. You would much rather be the stronger exactly. publication in a, in a field so successful it has at least two strong publications. <laughs> exactly. What, I keep wondering when somebody's going to do what we're doing. <laughs> it's really lonely out here. So, please be my guest. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Newsweek it kind of crumbled uh, in the last year as well. Um, so how did it go at first? Was Technologizer an instant hit? How, how did you? How did that work for you? Were you able to get advertising? Well, I, um, yeah, I, I, I basically thought about it at work for a while and then decided to do it. It's very brave. I'm uh, sure there are a lot of people watching who are saying, I, uh, "Boy, I'd like to do that in my business." 
How did, how, what do you need to do? Did you save up a lot of money? I, not really. I mean, actually, <laughs> I bought a house right before I quit my job. Oh, that's smart. I figured it would be easier to get a, a uh, mortgage when I'd been at the same job for 13 years. So I bought my house and then quit. And in terms of advertising, I partnered up with a company called Federated Media. Yeah. Which does ads. John Battelle's company. Yeah. Now, he, he's another old timer in the uh, PC uh, magazine uh, He business. was at, at Wired and he started yeah. the Industry Standard, yeah. which was another magazine that got to be very fat. Who said the future's on the web. Mm -hmm. And he started one of the first web banner ad selling companies. But he was smart. He picked very high quality, only a handful of very high quality blogs uh, to, to, to work with. So you got to work with him is, is a pretty high test. Yeah, which yeah. was great and really helped me get going. Um, By the way, they're struggling now too. They're in a, a changing world. Uh, yeah, it's amazing because what used to take 10 years Actually, probably used to take 100 years, then it took 50 years, 40 years, 10 years. Now a couple of years, and you, it's the business world. It, everything's changing so rapidly. You can't build a business on a single business plan. I don't know what the, what the answer is, but things are changing so rapidly. So Federated Media, that gave you instant income. It helped right yeah. away, and yeah. it gave me some credibility. Yep. And I kind of felt that on the web, um, all content is equal access to the web. And if something is worth reading, it will do well if it's at a big site. It can also do well if it's at a small site. And that did sort of turn out to be true because yeah. I, I very quickly got around 400,000 readers. Wow. I, at, when I started the site... That's for, a huge number. It, well, at, at the very start, I thought, I want to be the next tech crunch and I want to right. hire a whole bunch of people and become huge. But literally six weeks after I started the site, basically the economy collapsed and especially the media economy collapsed. And so I very quickly switched to a new business model, which was not to get big, but to stay really small and be the most important site I could be while small. And I found I could get 400,000 readers based on, on my content and content by a few good freelance contributors. It's hit-driven, though, isn't it? Because I remember that there were, there were, and it's still to this day, Harry McCracken's got the article of the week. It's yeah. like the one everybody has to read. And, there were, and you had a few of those in a row. Where you, I can't remember, Tell, give me a couple of them, because you obviously will remember them. Uh, well, the, the most successful story I did was called um, The 13 Greatest Error Messages of All Time, <laughs> which people are still reading to this day. Right. Those uh, things live. Yeah. That, yeah. That got like a million page views and, yeah. and huge numbers of people talking about it. And, did you quickly and realize comments. this is how it's going to have to work, is that I'm going to have to find that, that, that article... That's going to go viral. I, I knew already because at PCWorld.com, we, we began to do that even before I, I left. Is there a formula? A number is good, right? A list? Well, there are all kinds of formulas like lists and so forth, but it's also possible to do crappy lists <laughs> that nobody wants to read. And, that, and that's um, what happened to I feel very strongly. it became the list, yeah. the list uh, aggregator, right? You've got to believe in your own content. On the web, if you do something you don't believe in, people can tell. Yep. And so I, I tend to do the stories that got me excited. You can't be cynical um, about it and say, okay, I'm no. going to craft a hit article. You can, and you, you can, for a while you can succeed by being cynical. But I feel like long term, you'll do better if, if you're sincerely yeah. excited by your content. And yeah. when I thought about this, the idea of doing a list of, of the best error messages, like, like the blue screen of death and the sad Mac, I got excited by that. And so I put just as much effort into that as I would have if I had been doing something more serious. I remember that one very well. That was a great article. And yeah. then my readers started sending in their own favorite error messages I didn't mention. And so I did the 13 other greatest error messages of all time, <laughs> which was all reader-submitted stuff. Awesome. You, in, after the fact, you go, oh, that's obvious. But it isn't obvious until you do it. Then it's obvious, right? And you very quickly you know. Like in the old world of computer magazines, if you were lucky several weeks or months after you put out a magazine, you, you would hear how well it sold. Right. And PC World did reader surveys, so we had an idea of what people were reading. On the web, you know, literally sometimes within 10 minutes, you, you, know. you know. You see how many retweets, yeah. how many shares, how many likes. You could tell immediately. If it's on TechMeme, uh, if Google News picks it up. I remember uh, as if Davis used to, they do a lot of focus groups to see which were the most read articles within an issue. Because it's not enough to know that issue yeah. sold well. You're trying to find out, well, where are people reading? What we did articles? that every month, and it was extremely expensive, and it took many weeks before and we got any data. probably not accurate, right? I mean, how, how accurate is going to be? It gave you a general ballpark, but yeah. the, the issue with focus groups and surveys is... They tell you what uh, you want to hear. And, and the people who do them are people who have enough time to, to do them.
Yeah, they're not the audience you want either. PC World was for busy professionals, and busy right. professionals don't do surveys. Don't do surveys, yeah. So what, were there any surprises, articles that you thought, oh, nobody's going to be interested in this, that took off? Um, every, yeah, every once in a while, there would be, be something that would just pick up. Um, when, um, when Google came out with Chrome, I think, was it Chrome? Actually, I think Google discontinued the Google toolbar or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And there were all immense, immense numbers of people who loved the Google toolbar. And I, I did just a very short item on the Google toolbar, which for a while, if you searched on Google for, for Google toolbar, my story would, would show up. That's what you want. And, and it was not a, that big a story, but I had this huge influx of people. Right. And so I started doing more stories about the Google toolbar and more ambitious stories about the Google right. toolbar because, right. because I learned there was an audience for them. It really is different. You, you get immediate feedback like that. You can tune your, what you're doing. Now, the problem is, and I really see this also happening, is you, you become driven by it. Right. And then all of a sudden, it's all about link bait. It's all about how do I get that? It's almost an addiction. How do I get that again? I want to do that again. And what happens, and I see this a lot with blogs, and it's really been the, the detriment of, of journalism, not just tech journalism, but especially tech journalism, uh, is that people are writing sensationalistic stories, sensationalistic headlines. They don't really care. The Instagram story was a very good example of, of people kind of intentionally blowing it up almost. CNET wrote an article, Instagram wants to sell your pictures, which is, clearly wasn't what the story was, but I bet it got a lot more links than, than Neelai Patel saying, nah, it's not that bad. I bet Neelai's story did well, too, because A, it was really smart, yeah. and B, there were hundreds of sites doing stories about right. Instagram wanting to sell your pictures, right. and Neelai, he was taking a different stance, and he was smart about it, and, and that stands out. That's good news. So smart can still win. Basically, almost always the stories I've done that I, I'm most proud of are also the ones that do the best. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a really good example of that. When did, so did time come to you? How did that happen? Well, um, so I did Technologizer for a while, and I was having a great time and having fun. And um, I started talking to time. And I, while I enjoyed having my own site, I realized there was value in being associated with larger brands, too. Right. And I grew up on time. I mean, time is, right. is one of the things. Yeah, we got. were a Newsweek family. There yeah. was, you were one or the other, right? Yeah. Yeah. I had a great affinity for time growing yeah. up. And um, so I started doing a weekly technologizer column for time.com. And that turned out to be a lot of fun. And um, while I was having a really good time being on my own, I kind of felt like I, I had proven I could do it. And... Uh, and I loved Time, and I really enjoyed working with the Time folks, and they had fun with me. And um, so after about about a year and a half of kind of doing Time on the side, we started talking about, you know, a more serious uh, partnership. Now, is, the, is Technologizer in the print edition of Time, or is it web only? Um, I write for the print edition, too. I do, right. I do stuff all the time. I do some features for print. And... Um, do you worry that being in print is kind of old school? That maybe there, you, when you see Newsweek go stop its print edition, that maybe there isn't a future for print. I, I certainly wouldn't want to do a print entirely. Only. I yeah. mean, the web is, in a lot of ways, is way more fun and right. it's seat of the pants. And um, if you have an idea on the web, just do it. And if it fails, that's okay because you move on. Right. With print, you want the ideas to be really good because you have a limited amount of space, and uh, and there are more people involved in print. Uh, basically, I'm I'm pitching the time editors for, for stuff for print. But as part of what I do, it's a lot of fun. And, um, and that's part of why I came on board with Time. So right. technologizer.com, if you go to now, you land at time.com in a section which is just my stuff. Did you sell it to them? No. Um, I'm essentially lending the Technologizer name to Time. Um, my old content from before I started with Time still looks just the same. The new stuff is on time.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an employee of time. It's good, though, because you, you have this in the back pocket always. And you, you want to keep that brand alive, right? It's, it's a brand that's, that's yeah. served me well, and, yeah. and the, the time folks were excited by it. Good, good. And I'm having a good time doing this. It's a little bit different, but um, fun. It's really interesting to see people like you go the, basically the solo route. Brian Lamb did the same thing. And when he left Gizmodo, he started a wire cutter. I don't, and I don't know if there's, it seems like maybe there's a staff now. But initially, it was just, this is what I think is the best stuff. There was a good story on, on what he's doing in the New York Times by David Carr last week. I think it's really uh, interesting. I think that that's one of the exciting things about the Internet is that it is an opportunity for people to do something that you couldn't do before. You couldn't start a magazine 
by yourself. I always say, like in the old days, when, when IDG decided to start Computer Buying World in 1991, I mean, they, they hired an editorial staff. Millions. They, a, a finance department, a yeah. sales staff, yeah. uh, production people. They spent several months just getting ready to go. Uh, they ex- had real estate. They paid some company a lot of money every month to print it. <laughs> and on the web, almost all of those costs go away. Right. Although I look at something like what SB Nation did with The Verge, which was a very long build, a long time. In some ways, that's the old model of the way they did The Verge. They really spent a lot of time designing it, thinking about it. And, a lot closer, yeah. Yeah. And I think there's room for that as well. Obviously, The Verge is doing very well. But I, I'm glad to see that the solo uh, entrepreneurs can also do that. We're talking to Harry McCracken, technologizer.com. Takes you to his section on his little corner of the time.com world. Uh, our show today brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker, if you do presentations or podcasts, um, maybe you do, uh, you speak, uh, you probably go through a lot of stock photos, stock videos, illustrations. Maybe if you're doing uh, audio, you use music tracks and sound effects. Pond5 is the place to go. Look at this. 1.3 million video clips with 7,000 new ones this week. 8.2 million stock photos. 25,000 fresh ones this week. They've got illustrations. They've got music tracks. 1,500 new ones to the 80,000 track catalog. More than a quarter million sound effects. 2,600 After Effects projects. This is really... A treasure trove for you. And I want you to try it out because they've got a great browser that makes it very easy to find what you're looking for. You can sample it all uh, so you know exactly what you're getting. And this is what we call royalty-free. You buy it once and use it as you need to. Lots of 1080p video, by the way. Stock footage from everywhere, all around the world. All sorts of topics. Go to Pond5 every every week. They've got a new freebie, but I've got an even better deal for you. How about 50, 5 zero free Stock media files. All you have to do is go to pond5.com slash triangulation, and you can download all 50. See, their thinking is, if you make an account at Pond5 and you see how the browser works, see how the download works, you'll be comfortable. You'll come back the next time you need stock media, which may not be for a while. They're giving you 50 (laughs) sound effects, pictures, movies, after effects. This is pretty incredible. Pond5.com slash triangulation. I also want to talk to you folks who make these images and video. Pond5 is the best place to sell your business. They're shaking up the stock agency business with an open, artist-friendly marketplace. They give you the highest royalties in the business, 50% for every sale, and you set the pricing. So, in effect, you're saying exactly how much you're going to make. Great prices, but great selection. So if you're a media maker or a media artist, Pond5.com. In fact, they told me that many of their customers are both. They both buy and sell. It really is a marketplace for content. Go there now Pond through the rest of the month. We only have a little bit longer. Pond5.com slash triangulation. We thank them for their support of triangulation. Our guest is old friend Harry McCracken. Uh, You know, it's funny. I don't know if if I ever ran into you in those heady days of Comdex and now CES, um, but obviously we were parallel tracks all, all the way through. I, I, I was certainly following your shows back yeah. then. We were having fun. Uh, it, doing, doing television is very different than doing print, and it was very expensive and kind of probably not very practical, but Ziff Davis had the money and they wanted to do it, so that's fine. Paul Allen eventually uh, bought Tech TV and, and he was losing so much. He lost $300 million. He was losing so much money, he sold it to Comcast. And now, by the way... It's uh, the latest news. It's uh, G4, after eight years struggling, trying to make uh, a a technology channel work, uh, was mostly around gaming. Uh, Finally, they're they're thrown in the towel, and they've done a deal with uh, Hearst's uh, Esquire. They're going to become the Esquire channel. I have no idea what that means. But uh, there's a lesson learned. Don't go in the cable television business. It's a terrible business. I remember Pat McGovern, uh, the founder of I IDG. We so, kept hearing rumors well, that IDG well, was going to do TV. He, th- we did like one Computer World show. Right. And uh, it was such a bad deal that he, he said, okay, I'm not going <laughs> to make smart. that mistake again. He was smart. But I can tell you now, as if Davis was terrified, that IDG... In fact, one of the reasons I think we rushed ZDTV was because they were really afraid IDG was going to do something. Everybody was sure IDG. Pat was going to... People were always trying to figure out what Pat was up to. 
he was going to do TV. Yeah, he stayed out of TV after, after this one a experiment. wise man. So let's talk, you know, 2013's coming. It's going to be an exciting year. We have seen huge changes in 2012. Uh, mobile, location, the Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon stuff has been incredible. Um, iPads taking off, phones, uh, everything's getting smaller. What do you see as big trends for uh, 2013? What are you looking ahead? What are you looking for? When you go to CES, what will you be looking for? Well, part of the reason I'm having a good time doing what I'm doing is because this is the most fun time to write about technology since the 90s. No, since and, ever. Uh, I can tell you right now, this is this is amazing what's happening. And it's fun because it's so unpredictable. Yeah. If you had, back in 2006, if you had predicted the next five years, you would have totally botched it. Yeah. Uh, you would not have predicted most of the stuff that happened. Um, and so I think the next five years are probably equally unpredictable. But, I mean... It, one of the most fun things recently is just, has been the tablet wars. And until recently, they were a little bit depressing because you knew the iPad was doing well. And essentially, all these other tablets came rushing into the battle and would immediately flop. Moan down. Uh, and yeah. at least now we are, we are starting to see the beginnings of, of an actual tablet market with stuff like, like the Nexus and the Kindles and, uh, and so forth. And so I, I think the question now is can, can they build upon this relatively modest success and become a bigger deal? Um, on, with phones, we know Android is doing very well, and I expect Android to continue to do well. Um, and with tablets, we'll see. Windows 8 is like another big story for wow. CES and, and next year. What do you think? I mean, my, uh, you know, you've been covering Microsoft for a long, long time. This is the first time. It kind of surprises me even to, for me to say this out loud. They've ever made a PC. After all these years of selling operating systems and software to PC manufacturers, they're finally making a PC. This is a big bet. It's a huge bet. And I think the one thing we, I feel strongly we know for sure is it's going to be a while before we know whether the bet pays off. I, like Windows 8 and Surface came out on October 26th, and within about three weeks... You saw stories in the news, they were doing badly. Right. And I'm like, well, Windows 1.0 came out in 1985, and if you had tried to judge how Windows did after three weeks, it was doing badly. Right. Uh, it really took 10 years before uh, Windows started dominating everything when Windows 95 came out. And uh, the world moves more quickly than it did then, but I feel like Windows 8, it's going to be a while. It's going to be months and possibly years before it pays off. And it, it might be Windows 9 or Windows 10, where um, uh, it's clear whether it, it made sense or not. You think Microsoft has a chance? I, you know, I think it, it's a big bet, and it's, it's either going to end up doing better than everybody expects, or it's going to end up having been a, a big mistake. Even, it's, you know, if, if it's not a hit, it's a flop. I think Microsoft's in the position now where they cannot continue on as they have, right. just kind of uh. kind of grinding it out. They, they, they either have to show up or go home. I mean, they're, at, they're asking hundreds of millions of people to do something totally new. I no, think they did the right uh, thing doing that, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I, I think they it's did. gutsy, but I think they had to do that. But on the other hand, half the world is still using Windows XP after mm -hmm. 11 years. That's true. And won't even move to Windows 7. They're not going out of business. They've got no. a nice, solid line of business. That's no question uh, about it. They're like IBM. I mean, in 20 years, they'll still be selling probably Windows 7. Microsoft's not going to collapse or anything. No. But, but will they be at the center of the industry? Not clear, and and they're, they no longer in the cat bird seat. They're they're kind of the scrappy. Uh, they're they're number two. They got to try harder. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Who would have thought that? Depending on which market you're talking about, they're like number three or number four <laughs> in, in some the cases. cell phone market. They're lucky to be there at all, and yet they have great product. Uh, I think you could argue that Windows Phone Eight is the best of the Windows Eight uh, products. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very, very impressive. Yeah, um, but is it enough? Is it is it, it is it timely enough? Uh, they have a very big challenge, but Android and iPhone. It's very, it's fun. What about BlackBerry? You think they're coming back? Everybody seems to be paying attention all of a sudden to BlackBerry 10 as if maybe there's a shot. Yeah, I mean, lately you've seen sort of the first slightly optimistic yeah. stories about it. Uh, suppose, Saw a story today say the browser just smokes. Yeah, the, 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 car the carriers appear to honestly be excited by it. Um, essentially, you're not... You're, it's not really a war between the iPhone and Android in a lot of ways. It's really a war between Apple and Samsung, who are these two huge companies that are both doing very well. And in theory, at least, the, the Verizons and AT&Ts of the world would like another, another 
competitor besides Apple and Samsung. Right. Um, so a third platform, which BlackBerry has. Um, so the it, carriers are going to be interested. It, this is the theory, at least. Yeah. I mean, it's they have a huge uphill right. road ahead of them. But at least they're actually going to ship something soon. Right. They've, they've spent the last few years just sort of twiddling their thumbs. Right. We live, how do you keep out of the bubble? We live, it's unfortunate because the people who report on technology, we really are in a bubble. Our relationship with technology is abnormal. We, you know, we, we love it more than probably most people do. We care about it. We follow it more closely than most people do. And it's very easy to think that the way you and I and all our friends think is the way real people think. How do you keep from getting in that? You know, at time, it's really easy because almost all of my colleagues are in New York hmm. and they're not tech they're reporters. <laughs> well, they're, they're actual people of all types. Right. And um, when I write something and turn it in for the magazine, um, if they don't understand it, I right. know that, that I That's wasn't good. clear enough. Uh, when they start to get interested in stuff, I know it, it's, it matters to people. Like when, when they started talking about Pinterest a year ago, I knew that Pinterest was not just something within the Silicon Valley bubble. Right. One of the things that makes it so hard to predict what's going to happen this year or in f certainly farther down the road is that uh, technology is full of these paradigm shifts, these discontinuities where everything you know is wrong. It's all changed. Pinterest is a good example of just like, what? <laughs> where the hell did that come from? Uh, the Internet certainly was, was like that. Um, what, is, what do you think the next... I mean, it's impossible to predict because that's the nature of it. What do you think the next big thing might be? I mean, it's probably the, the Internet of Things, meaning it's not just about PCs. Right and tablets and phones, which people think of as computing devices. Right. It's a world in which everything is a computing device. Wow. So your car, your thermostat. Right. Um, Nest is a good things example. Things like Nest. This is Fitbit, which right. connects directly to... Right. To, um, it can upload data directly to the Internet without needing a device in the middle. You know what's stopping that from... I think that that could happen today. But what's stopping it is that uh, everybody is siloed. And it's really a problem. For instance... Home automation, everybody was sure that was going to take off, but you had four different standards or five different standards. Nothing was dominant, and, and nothing worked with anything else. So you ended up buying one thing, and that's all that worked. You know, I just got the Philips Hue lights. They have their Zigbee, which is the pro, uh, one of the protocols, um, but it doesn't work. It would be nice if, for instance, I could write an action script or an Apple script that would tell the lights to dim, the TV to come on, but none of this stuff works with anything else. If it did, the Internet of Things could be amazing. How do we solve that? Well, hopefully there will be more standards. I mean, we, I, in a lot of ways, we live in a more siloed world than we did a few years ago. It's terrible. Uh, because there are things like Facebook, where uh, if you put your stuff in Facebook, it, it's, That's it. it's, it's kind of siloed there. Yeah. And Twitter is a silo. It's like, AOL, it's like 100 AOLs. And it's, it's, it's just as bad in a, a hardware as well. I mean, your Fitbit would be cool. It would be great if I could have health sensors all over my body that would know all of this stuff and then to a center but it doesn't nothing talks to anything else the fitbit just talks to the fitbit i think over time that'll happen i hope uh, so it's going to be it'll definitely be better consumers but it'll also be better for the business yeah oh absolutely there's you know there's a lot of money to be made and where you really see it is in content where you have uh the incumbents like comcast and verizon holding on <laughs> for dear life and it's keeping things like an Apple TV that could really transform how we consume content from happening. Because if, if Apple can't make the deals with the content creators, they've got nothing. And that, you know, one of the reasons we've, we're in a little bit more of a siloed world recently, I think, is because everybody's looking at Apple's success. And Apple has been... And they so, are, they're the ultimate silo. Apple is a huge silo. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they build the, yeah. you know, the content, the services, the software, the hardware, the processor. Right. Uh, and that has worked so well for them that everybody is trying to do that. Eric Schmidt talked about the four horsemen of the Internet, the four engines of the Internet, Facebook, Apple, Google, and Amazon. He left out Microsoft, and I think that was intentional. Do you agree those are the companies to watch? Well, I mean, yes, except a lot of the truly disruptive stuff always comes from smaller companies, and all of those companies were quite small when they first started. That's why it's disruptive. disruptive. We never heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to be uh, Google. What about wearable computing? Are you interested? In, that's kind of part of the Internet of Things, isn't it? If your glasses suddenly are smart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. I, I think I agree with you, Harry. This is the, you couldn't pick a better time to be a technology journalist. It's a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah, and you're doing a great job. 
If you go to technologizer.com, that's where you'll find Harry's uh, stuff. And you'll see a lot more of him on Twit and all of our shows because we just think he's one of the most astute observers of this stuff. That's, where, that's why Technologizer worked because you knew if Harry wrote an, a, th a thoughtful, long piece about something, that that was going to be the piece to read. And you keep doing that. That's great. We appreciate it. It's nice Thank to you, see Leo. you. Thank you, Harry. Always a pleasure. Always fun. We do Triangulation Wednesday afternoons right after Twig, and that's usually around 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that'd be about midnight UTC. I hope you'll tune in and watch live. We love it, getting the feedback from the chat room. If you can't, though, on-demand versions of the show are available. In fact, we've got 83 shows in the can now. You can go back and watch each and every one at twit.tv slash TRI. You can also uh, subscribe. In fact, I would ask you to do so. It'd be really great if you did through iTunes or Zune or Dogcatcher or Instacast or whatever it is that you use to uh, keep track of podcasts. We're right in there. Just search for Triangu. Next week, it's the best of, right? I think we have a best of with a bunch of interesting interviews collated from the last uh, 12 months of shows. I think you're going to enjoy it. You can't possibly have seen them all, and uh, there'll be some gems in there. And then we'll be back in a couple of weeks with uh, another episode, I guess January 2nd, day after New Year's, yeah, of Triangulation. So thanks for being with us in 2012. We look forward to a great year in 2013. I'm Leo Laporte. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Thank you.